Welcome to the 100th Monkey Radio Show with Tom and Ramon. A couple of short things before we get going here. Visit the website. A lot of good stuff going on. We hopefully have most of the bugs worked out on the archive section. And let's see, what else? Popped a few things in the news, some new videos that we popped on there. Uh, we're still open to any suggestions for our new Paradigm page. We are always looking for excellent new ideas and information that will help us take the next step into our future. So if you've got any ideas or have come across any material, drop us an email. Let's see, we also do t- work on a donation basis. Ramon and I work for a living and this is all coming out of our pockets. So if you have the ability to help us out, don't be afraid. <laughs> I won't be afraid to take it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't forget, sometime like probably June or July, we also planning the uh, Damon Her uh, trip over to northern Italy. Click on the picture. This place is amazing. Right. It's one of those new paradigm towns. We've got a couple people that are very interested in doing it right now already, so uh, it, we are looking to get a group of, uh, oh, I don't know, up to 10 people, Ramon, would you say? Somewhere yeah. there. I think that would be a, a nice, comfy, manageable group. I think we could have a lot of fun there. I think we had a lot of fun. Learn a lot, too. That place is absolutely amazing. So who do we have, Ramon? Today we have someone special. If you were at East City, that would be about two weeks from when this airs. Two weeks, three weeks ago. Uh, we have Neil Kramer. is an English writer, speaker, and philosopher in the fields of consciousness, metaphysics, shamanism, and ancient mystical disciplines. For over 20 years, Neil has independently studied philosophy, psychology, shamanism, Zen, ancient indigenous wisdom traditions, inner alchemy, occultism, esoteric world history. He shares his path of inner transformation in writings, interviews, and lectures, as well as giving one-to-one teaching. Welcome, Neil Kramer. Well, hello, guys. How are you doing today? I got to say, it was such a pleasure to meet you over at ESETI. No, it was great. It was a pleasure to meet you guys as well. You do a lot of good work and you're instrumental not only in a lot of the mechanics of your show and what you do and your own personal paths, but also I know that you um, do a lot of work with the Seti family and it's uh, it's much appreciated. We'll send you a check for saying such nice things. (laughs) (laughs) Please, please, feel free, feel free. Yeah, there you go. So how do you enjoy the Seti experience, Neil? Well, the conference to begin with, took place in an exceptionally beautiful place, and everybody who's ever been always says that. And, you know, you can look around on the internet at some pictures and see people stood in a field with a pine tree, tree line, and then behind it, an enormous mountain. And everybody's seen these pictures um, who who is interested in East City and the conferences and what James Gilliland and, and so on and so forth, what they do. But to actually be there is something completely different. Um, You have this pristine wilderness environment with the the trees and the rivers and the meadows. And then, of course, behind it, you have this, what, 12,000-foot Mount Adams, which is, you know, permanently snow-capped. And it's just so lovely to to look at that snow on that grey mountain with its little forested speckles, you know, you can see from a distance. And all this from the lush, you know, green fields of the Seti Ranch with the sun beating down on you. So it is a, a, an extraordinary location to hold an event of, you know, a few hundred people who come along to it, quite a lot of people. Um, and I think, quite frankly, if nobody actually said anything and the whole thing was silent for four days, it would still be amazing. <laughs> Yeah, it definitely will be. And for those of you who are planning to go up there, make sure you take a sweater. A lot of people uh, forget that the temperature in Washington changes drastically at night time. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? But yeah, seriously, I mean, the, 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 the conference environment really helps to permeate everybody's experience in a, in a positive way. And there's a great line of speakers and, um, as ever, um, a very, very well-informed, educated, diverse, switched-on audience so it makes the speakers a bit sharper because you can't really just do a routine on them and you can't really just come out with the old stuff. You've got to be good. You've got to use new material. You've got to be dynamic. So it raises everybody's game, really. And then, of course, the other aspect of it is socially. Um, 
before and around and outside and afterwards, there's a lot of dialogue shared um, and nobody's separating themselves out from anybody else. So, yeah, it's just the, the quality of communication by all the people who make this pilgrimage to that place is, is just first class. As far as during the, the uh, speakers, did you experience when the – not during the panel when Mel was asking the questions, but before – when we were introducing everybody. The opening um, ceremony. I think the yeah, opening ceremony. Thank you. Did you experience anything or see anything? Um, which which one do you mean? There was, there was one on Thursday and there's one on Friday. Which one? The one on Thursday. Um, I think it depends when, when you say see what you mean. I think anybody who can tune in to what's going on there, I think before you see it, you can feel something. And I think a lot of people have said, even people who are quite, you know, logical and reductionist or whatever, who are, who are out there looking to explore that, a lot of people said the same thing, which is they did feel um, a shift and a, a tuning in, especially in a room where there's a, a ceremony or a blessing or a, a, you know, a group meditation or whatever. And I think pretty much anyone in the room, if they want to, can feel that. As to what you see, I think that's, that's different. depends on the individual. Yeah. The, the reason why I was asking that, because so many people who said, I, you know, I've never seen auras before, or I've never seen beans before, were seeing things. So I was just amazed how many people kind of like popped open um, during that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we'll, we'll get into this maybe as... as, as as we go on with this conversation, the three of us, but a lot of people that I spoke to, um, I mean, you've got people who go there all the time and that's great. And they're just, you know, on their journey and still moving along, still developing. But the, the new people who come there, first timers like myself, um, in, in that sense, they often kind of shared something, which was that they were looking to make contact with that, subtler realm with that different dimensional space and again we're not talking about new ages here most of the time we're talking about you know middle-aged blokes with the uh, you know kind of like quite regular clothes on or like old ladies in the 60s and 70s and stuff as well as you know the younger people of course so it's quite a mixed background i mean you two guys again you'll know this but it is excellent to see that and all of them who were new had some similar parallel in saying, well, I've come here to, to have an experience and to open myself up to whatever that kind of experience flavor is for them. So for some people it was UFOs and extraterrestrial contact, which is, which is this sounds odd for a lot of people, which is quite a normal thing in that place. Um, and for other people it was, like nature spirits and elemental forces and more sort of terrestrial phenomena. But regardless of whatever they were looking for, there was this shared desire to have an experience. So, you know, you feed your brain with the talks and the dialogue and so on. But you would often see people wandering off in little groups or even on their own into the fields and the, the woods and stuff in search of these little special meditative moments and of course, when the sun went down, all that ramped up another level because the, the ability to do these things without um, natural light is often increased. What got you started on your path? How did you end up giving these talks and, and going out? Was there one point in your life where you it kind of clicked or was this something that happened little by little? Well, you know, I'm asked that question quite a lot and... There's, there's many different ways of approaching it, but essentially it was just a perception that there was something wonderful and mysterious about this world. And there was a lot of unknowns and there was a lot of adventurous avenues. And I found that quite exciting. And I was curious really why no one else seemed to be that bothered about it. There was a few weirdos and a few new agers and a few religious people, a few crazies but they were on the fringe and they weren't doing it, their investigation or their studies or their experiential unfoldment with any sort of discipline or real alignment. 
and so that is what got me started. I began to look into this arcane and this ancient wisdom about the way the world's put together, where we're from, what we're doing here, etc. And that, if you do it fully, if you do it as a full spectrum study, um, involves philosophy and mysticism and spirituality, um, esoteric religion, exoteric religion, it involves the paranormal, it involves the whole thing really. And so it takes a long time, um, it takes you know a lifetime to, to, to amass that wisdom. And each area of study, you, you could go off and spend your whole life just looking at one area. So for me, it's always a question of balance and a question of spirit really, which is what guides me. So I'm not afraid to be portrayed as a mystic and some people know me as that or as a philosopher, some people know me as that. But really, you're talking about spiritual philosophy, how things are put together, how we think about the world. And as I reminded people um, in the talk, that just that word philosopher, we, we often associate it with, you know, professors with dusty old jackets on sat in a room full of books <laughs> somewhere. You know what I mean? And actually, philosopher is just someone who loves wisdom. So... Um, you know that's what it means and it's it's a word that i think we have to sort of take back and take out of the exclusive realm of academia and say well really everybody who went to that conference and who goes to events like that or who is interested in those subjects in their own private studies and reflections we're all philosophers because we all appreciate and love wisdom not just the knowledge but also the experience as well. So the gnosis, fusing that knowledge into experience, that's really what brings us proper wisdom. And um, I think that, that movement is very natural. So really the answer to your question is how, how did you start this? It, it's really removing all the obstacles. That's the trick, is to configure your life in a way that you can make the time and the space and the energy available to pursue the mystery and the authentic sort of reality of life and mysticism really is is the uh, technical description of that in a way in, in that a mystic is somebody who seeks ultimate reality i.e the the real dynamics the real purpose behind the projected reality you know that this being just a veil which everybody's familiar with probably who listens to this show and the mystic is really the one who says, well, that's really interesting, but I'm not so much interested in the particulars of that veil, the things and colours and cars and objects and trees and tables. What I'm interested in is what lies behind it, the purpose of it, meaning of it, the design of it. And that's what a mystic does. And, you know, they're always essentially, appropriately enough, few in number. So when other mystics get together at conferences and gatherings and events and workshops and stuff that's why the energy is so highly tuned because it's a rare thing because usually we're moving in a space where nobody's interested in mystical matters they're interested in the particulars the objects and so that's the only thing that separates um you know one group from the other really right some cultures it wasn't that long ago where everybody practiced some sort of mysticism that hmm. we would say what 50 years uh, ago in some cultures and 100 years in others for it to be westernized thousands of years in others though yeah yeah i mean if you, if you look at the aboriginals for forty thousand years they've been doing it in complete unbroken line you know not only the genetic heritage has been very um, pure in a way but also the spiritual heritage has been very pure in that it's, it's not been hugely influenced, partially due to the challenges that the land itself provides, but also due to their own uh, tenacity and their own fierce independence. And as with a lot of indigenous communities, it's the ones who have been targeted um, because of the land who have fallen into a state of destitution of alcoholism or drug abuse or whatever, just as with a lot of um, American Indian reservations or whatever, I'm not sure what the politically correct terminology for these things is anymore, like an Anu, Aboriginal, Indian, Native American, but we know what we're talking about, the peoples who were first 
here who've been here for a long, a long time that we can track. They, of course, were not the first here, but they, they were the first here that we can see in the um, normal course of historical documentation. My view is that um, if you can stay within your own cultural paradigms and choose what cultural influences come in and out, so you don't isolate yourself necessarily, but you choose how you do it, then keeping a pure spiritual connection is not very difficult for a human being. I think it's quite straightforward. The problem is when it's not your cultural choice and you find yourself subsumed within a massive cultural media plex, uh, you know, walking down the, the street, in, you know, Times Square in New York, uh, Leicester Square in London, whatever, you know, the, these places that represent what that media plex looks like. And it isn't just the entertainment, it's the, the whole thing, you know, I call it the whole unreality that is foisted upon us, I call the construct, the consensus reality that is really synthetic and it, it provides us with everything we think we need. And authentic human souls that reach a point in their life where they reject the construct and say, no, that isn't what I want to do. And actually, it's not even real. It's somebody's representation of one tiny part of third dimensional reality, and it's not mine anymore. And so there, there is a certain defiance and a certain... Uh, revolutionary aspect to a lot of mystics and spiritual people in that they know that they're making a, a tricky choice really to get off easy street and you know just going for a nice car and nice toys in the house and a nice you know set up and really risking all that for something that seems to ordinary people very subtle and very ephemeral which is wisdom and which is ultimate reality so um, it's, a, it's an unusual choice, but that construct is the only thing really that prevents a lot of people from a natural connection with their own spirituality. Because once you remove that and you put somebody in a particular sort of environment, and I've seen this close up many times over the years, they begin to develop without any sort of effort whatsoever their own spiritual connection, their own mysticism their own curiosity, their own enthusiasm, and they begin to channel it into that. And to achieve that, one has to, certainly in the West, whether you're in the States or Europe, Britain, Japan, wherever, um, you have to carefully moderate your attachment to the mainstream media because it, it is not really a very accurate representation of reality. And yet it has an extraordinarily deep influence on people's way of thinking about the world. And if you can control the way someone thinks about the world, you actually control the world itself. Yeah. So we know that. I guess most of the people who listen to your show know that. But it's good to remind us, ourselves of it because that is one of the obstacles to contemporary spiritual practice is the media because it doesn't really want anyone to do that. Right. Yeah. In the last few years, or oh, last 10, 20 years, I've noticed that the awareness of consciousness and spirit in the world appears to be growing rapidly in the last 20, 30 years. Uh, what do you see as the, some of the major contributing factors to that expansion of awareness? Well, it's funny, actually, you asked that question, Tom, because um, I'm just writing a new essay on this very subject at the moment. It's very, it's very relevant and, and prescient for, for me. I think particularly over the last few years, let's say the last 15 10, 15 years, there has been a more natural gravitation for authentic people to move away from the mainstream, from the construct. And it really stems from a very simple thing, which is a lot of people feel that something's wrong and that politics isn't helping, the governments aren't really our friends at all, and there's got to be another way of doing things. And that way is not by voting in Democrats, Republicans, Labour, Conservative, it's not a political shift. It's a whole paradigm shift in consciousness. And I think a lot of people feel that, even people who don't talk in this sort of language and don't use metaphysical terms or are, are not accustomed to it or perhaps are not even comfortable with it. Regardless of your language and how you articulate it, people feel it. And that, that's the key thing, feeling it. And 
that has grown and grown and, and one of the reasons there's two factors the first one is that i think there is a natural energetic movement of consciousness that goes around in cycles and we're nearing a shift point at the moment and it's like a curve on a graph it's not a switch that's thrown it's a curve on a graph and we're nearing the peak of that curve and at those moments the tendency for people to wake themselves up and have courage and make changes is much more elevated than normal and these things come around in you know various incremental millennial cycles and we're, we're at another one now another seasonal change you know the seasons four seasonal changes every year unless you live in california obviously but mm-hmm. apart from that there are proper seasonal changes on the gal- galactic scale and they change the way the sun works the way the energies interrelate between the planetary bodies the way the archetypes resonate in the collective memory the way physically the atomic structure is held together and the way consciousness plays between those things so this field this like akashic field this quantum vacuum this substrata this plenum is is changing and evolving just like an organism and that happens and we're at a very pivotal point now as the shift is upon us so that's that's a metaphysical movement we might say in conjunction with that the other the other a factor that I think is is affecting these things is that the old hierarchy, i.e. the elites who have controlled things on Earth for the last few thousand years, perhaps a lot longer, are struggling at the moment. They're really struggling. And over the last five years, specifically the last five years, I have noted a very definite dislocation of their power base. And I've looked at the way that's affected the way they do things and what sort of countermeasures they've put out there to compensate for their inadequacies. And so that leads me to the conclusion that right now, in July 2011, we can say that a simple truth is upon us, which is the control system is beginning to break down. It's not working very well anymore. And the cracks that they've been sort of papering over are so large such huge chasms that you they can't just paper over them anymore and people can see those cracks and people don't believe in obama and cameron and merkel and netanyahu and all the rest of them in quite the same way that they used to do of course there's still legions of you know ignorant population out there who lap it up because they don't know any better but for anyone who's taken the time to sort of scratch under the surface a little bit and actually look into it politically or philosophically, whichever, it becomes pretty obvious it's a sort of dead game, really. It's a game that's run out of players and, you know, it doesn't function properly anymore. And it's no use. There is no activist, political, revolutionary systems of solution within that. It's something completely different. And because they're very clever, this old hierarchy, they confuse us by giving us fake leaks and fake hackers and fake mavericks and fake new hopes and that confuses a lot of people so they think that various people who come into the uh, media plex who look like naughty boys or naughty girls are like heroes and they're going to help us change things and that is just another fake thing it doesn't it doesn't work like that but the whole game from top to bottom has to be changed so they're just desperately clinging on to whatever remnants of control they have left because really their control is based on people controlling themselves and that's the thing that's beginning to falter that isn't working as well as it used to do so they ramp it up and they get silly with you know the violence and aggression that's threatened but actually people are so sort of desensitized to it they've sort of backfired now And you're thinking, well, well, whatever, shoot, may kill, may burn the place down, couple asteroids at the Earth, all, you know, piss off into space, whatever, just bring (laughs) it on. A lot of people are like, you know, we're sick of it. You know, if you're going to do something, do it. Yeah. uh, Because this is rubbish and we want to do something better. And people aren't interested in the Casey Anthony trial. That's not captivating the American public. No one's bothered about that. The only people bothered about what the hot news of the day is are the people directly affected by it 
what people want is authenticity and is to live in a real way and to live in a creative way, in a loving way, in a um, dynamic way, in a humorous way. You know, they want all those things. And the media is not able to provide that. And so the only option for a lot of people is to sedate themselves with television and booze and drugs and, you know, junk food and what have you. And we all do it a little bit, but a lot of people do it in a very chronic way, in a very self-harming way. And even those people are coming to wake up to think this isn't really a very good way of behaving anymore. So I think you take that organic movement of natural energy, increasing its frequency of vibration, just in the same way that a sound wave or a light wave would increase its frequency to give us a different pitch or a different colour. So the frequency of consciousness moves, and the Mayans have mapped this um, a long time ago, quite accurately in my view. Add to that the synthetic collapse of the control system and of all these um, shenanigans and all this um, framework of containment, the fact that people aren't buying that anymore and they're less afraid of it is adding to this waking up. And it's a, it's a small number of people in, in my um, observation. It's not, we're not talking about a global tidal flow of billions of people waking up. I don't think it, it, it works like that and I don't think it needs to work like that. I think what we're talking about is a certain critical mass, which is perhaps reflected in your program title, of course. Yeah. Um, and when they, when they wake up, that's adequate for everyone else to plug into. I'm going to take two questions and try to jumble them up into one. As you mentioned before, you know, the title of our show, The Hundredth Monkey Theory, and the word transformation, because I, I got to see your talk, and I'm going to combine the two questions. Where do you think that critical mass is, or at, at what point do you think that critical mass that we have that, transformation and again what is real transformation because it's not just me changing into a, a, a white shirt and yesterday i had a black shirt no although that is a transformation but it's a very, <laughs> it's a very it's a very mundane one but that is a transformation everything all the time is transforming isn't it really right um our bodies transform moment by moment the sun transforms you know the desk that you you sat at everything really is transforming all the time and it's all impermanent the difference with when we associate the word awakening with transformation is that we're saying rather than us being deluded by the illusion of permanency we actually see change and we own that change and we claim that change and in the spiritual tradition that i have studied some very well-known, like Buddhist and Zen and Taoist and um, shamanic indigenous North American and European traditions, and other less well-known ones um, in Europe, uh, secret mystery school traditions and so on, and Hermetica and, 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 and whatnot. There is a golden thread that runs through a lot of this, which leads me to think that there is really a sort of single source of knowledge of the secret knowledge that points to, you know, a lot of different groups reflect this sacred knowledge of how the world is put together and how it works. And they all have their own little cultural icons and fabrics and symbols and smells and incenses and rituals and what have you. And depending on where you live, you might gravitate to an Eastern uh, system or a Western system or a contemporary one or an ancient one. But actually, when you get down to it, the principles of it are all very, very, very much the same. And they center around the fact that there are a number of different kinds of existence, a number of different dimensions or densities or planes or fields, whatever you want to call it. And the quantum physicist and the mystic are getting closer and closer together as, as the years roll by and how they actually describe that. The difference is the mystics were doing it about 10,000 years ago, and the physicists have been doing it for about 100 years, so there's a, there's a slight catch-up going on. But it helps people. The physics is important because it helps people convince themselves and persuade themselves that this is a real thing. We're not talking about theory here. We're not talking about faith. We're talking about a very real, large universe that is very, very coherent and very, very magical, essentially. 
and the containment that we find is really a game of keeping us just in one density, in the third density. And again, as I said earlier, left to our own devices, we naturally ascend through those different dimensions and experiences. It's quite normal. But it's been taken so out of the syllabus, so off the um, intellectual curriculum, no one in school is learning about this stuff. And the only people who touch on it are physicists or classical historians who will look at religious systems of thought. But they're so stupefied and so myopic that most people don't really go very far with it because it's very dull, in fact. So we have to take it upon ourselves to move into a transformation of our own design, really. So that word transformation is something that we do consciously to say, you can't just be the same entity, the same guy or the same girl when you go on this spiritual journey and just do it as a hobby or just do it now and again when you can fit it in. It's something that begins to shape your whole life inside and out. And you can either let transformation happen to you from the outside, apparently, or you can actually take hold of it and grasp it and say, right, I'm going to go with this. And I can't quite control it because it, it, has a, it has an intellect and it has a spirit and a direction of its own, which is working in a way that I don't understand. However, like the surfer on the way, I can make movements and choices in how I go with that flow. So rather than just sort of crash and burn, I can, with a little bit of grace and a little bit of skill, I can actually move with it. And that's, that's what we, we mean by transformation in this sense. Awakening, enlightenment, all those different terms, you know, that's the process. That's the process of becoming wiser, of increasing the vibration of our being, of our consciousness from a low state like a rock to a high state, a higher state like a plant or a tree and a higher state like a human and then a higher state of beings that we call mythological beings and higher and higher still until you move away from self altogether and enter into what the Victorians would call the celestial realms or the heavenly realms as the, the Buddhists would say. And these spaces are just part of the university of consciousness that we move through. And it's quite normal. It takes a long time, many thousands of years. You don't just do it in your hundred year allotment on earth. It takes a long time. Um, we know that awakening is a process. We know that transformation is a process. And so you can't really go wrong with it, horribly wrong with it at least. The worst you can do is delay this journey. And most people, that's exactly what they do because they don't really want it because the unknown part of that transformation is, is, is quite scary to a lot of people. And they're, they're afraid of how it will affect the families and the livelihoods and the bank bounces and, you know, what's in the refrigerator next week. And that's understandable. And everybody knows what that feels like, everybody. Um, what the, tr the trick is, the art of it, is integrating it incrementally, bit by bit, all day, every day, but in ways that you can design and manage yourself. So sometimes it's just a way of looking at the world in a more disciplined and discerning fashion. And other times exercising a bit of intellect in being, you know, your own sort of scholar or your own um, teacher. And then other times it's about pushing out your comfort zone, pushing your boundaries a bit further out, going to places that you don't know much about, going to a conference or a gathering that you don't need to go to, but you know it will be really a positive shift for you. And some people are a bit shy about that, and not everybody finds that easy to do. But that's part of the initiation, is pushing yourself out of your comfort zone and saying, okay, I know I don't really like doing that kind of stuff, but I'm going to do it anyway. What the hell? I'm going to push myself in that zone. And nine times out of ten, certainly people I've spoken to have shared their time with me. When that happens, it's always a good result. And the universe rewards risk takers in that fashion. Okay, well, guys, we had a little bit of an issue here with our connections, uh -huh. and we got everything reset. And I think we're back on, except for Ramon's buzzing and beeping on his hotel phone. What's going on there, bud? 
I got it. Don't worry. It <laughs> okay. So, back into things. So, Neil, there was a question I wanted to ask at the panel discussion at ESETI last week and, and wasn't able to. Uh, here it goes. As above, so below. Many changes are taking place within humanity and our biosphere, looking at what we have begun to understand about other dimensions and beings who exist in those dimensions, and also considering the societal structure of this world with the corruption, greed, violence, compartmentalization, etc., 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 that we witness. I have asked myself what, if any changes, are these other beings and dimensions going through at this time also? Wow, that's quite a question, isn't it? <laughs> It's a shame you didn't get a chance to put that to the panel because that's a, yes. that's a cracker. Um, I think the, the simple answer to that question is that if you perceive the different densities of reality from the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, those seven dimensions as nested like uh, Russian dolls all inside each other, it used to puzzle people in the past when they'd say, well, why, why do the um, such and such a beings from another system give a shit about what's happening on this little dust ball on one corner of one solar system in one part of a, a little galaxy? Why, why should that affect things? Um, the reason is when you comprehend this dimensional model that because each dimension enfolds the preceding ones, in other words, we could say that there's a density of being which, let us say, for example, that a rock is a first density being and a tree is a second density being and a human is a third density being. Our third density obviously includes those preceding ones. So we can see the trees and we can see the rocks. The fourth density that wraps around us includes us. So what we do affects them. Just like if all the trees burn down, that affects us. Now, it's not just space we're talking about here. It's actually the frequency of consciousness itself. And that can be understood as a, as a waveform, as an oscillation, if you like. So if you think that everything vibrates at a certain pace, a certain frequency, then the faster it vibrates, the more oscillation there is, the closer those waves are together, the more it can move be between those dimensional spaces. So to cut a long story short... It is an ecology, just like any other ecology, and everything that takes place in that affects everything. So one drop in the ocean affects the whole ocean, some in subtle ways and some areas in very profound ways. And my understanding, my comprehension of how this universe fits together, which is a, a synthesis of mystical information, spiritual law and spiritual philosophy and physics my own observations, my own uh, work in those areas, some of it normal, some of it esoteric. If you put all that stuff together, it certainly shows to me that there is this very sophisticated and very beautiful model of uh, what you could really divide down into seven spaces, seven densities. And the big problem on Earth at the moment and that has been for at least 4,000 years, probably about six, maybe even 12. It's, it's, it's difficult to tell right now. Um, but we will know. But right now, it's, it's, not, it's not available at our fingertips. But the big problem on Earth for a long time, let us say, has been that we've been convinced and deceived into thinking that there is only a one density, and that's the third density, and that's it. So any thoughts or any notions of mythological beings or nature spirits or extraterrestrials, Andromedans, Venusians, uh, Pleiadians, Arcturians, whatever, that is just crazy talk, really. That is just the talk of people who've gone off the page, off the map, off the, the sort of, you know, railway tracks altogether. And that's understandable when you're only operating on that third frequency in that third space in that third density because that is all that you see when you're in that space and anything outside it seems unimaginable and to some people that makes them scared and to other people it makes them laugh uh, but they're both things where the unknown is not able to be pulled into one's field of perception 
So one of my suppositions, one of my theories was to say that you can very much align those seven dimensional spaces or ways of being with the perceptive array, the seven portals or seals or bands or chakras in the body. So if you're only really going to fire on those first three cylinders of the root, the sacral and the solar plexus as ways of modulating energy, you're only going to see those three densities of being. You're only going to see the humans, the animals, the plants and the rocks. And that, that's fine. That's okay. Because they're legitimate, credible, important parts of the universe. But they're not the only parts of the universe. In fact, they're only three-sevenths of it, to be exact. And so we're missing out an awful lot of stuff. And my um, kind of uh, central philosophy, really, is to say, if you go about your spiritual pra practice, one of the first stages is to put the mind in order and is to clear house and to clean up, basically. And if you go about that in the right way, some of it being psychological and emotional and psychic, but all pretty understandable stuff, that some of which we covered in the workshop uh, briefly, which people responded very well to and understood and knew that it was important. You, you have to clear the mind and you have to discipline the mind before you can do any, let us say, higher dimensional work. Because if you don't, the mind really generates a sort of static which prevents a, a clear signal from being able to be received or transmitted. So I have this phrase, make the space to receive the signal. And that's different for everybody. So for some people it means you have to eat a certain type of foods, or you have to wear certain clothes, live in a certain environment, say certain things, um, and set up an environment around you that is conducive to clear thinking. For other people, they don't need to go to those lengths. So some people need to go and sit in a cave for 50 years. Other people need to do a little bit of meditation, clear out, stop watching TV, and choose what they put into the mind and soul, really. And so depending on where you are and how much baggage you've accumulated and how much incorrect wiring you're carrying around, which is not a sin and it's not bad, it's what happens when we encounter pain. We, we usually create incorrect wiring. And then when that pain is triggered throughout the rest of our life, we just fire up again that incorrect wiring so there has to be a process of what the New Age and alternative communities would say, you know, inner healing. There has to be a process of that. And I think it's something that, as a warrior, if you don't understand the art of healing, you don't last very long. So it's right. not a feminine thing. It's not a New Agey thing. It's actually a warrior's discipline is to understand healing. And when I've done karate and kung fu in my life, understanding how to heal injuries and dislocations and sprains and ligament tears and so on is part of the art of the, the martial practice. It's understanding how the body works. And so the healing with offense and with defense is all part and parcel of the same thing. And so it is with consciousness. So it is with the mind that we have to understand that we can't really just leave our old way of life behind with all its unresolved problems and traumas and dark areas. You can't just jump ship and leave the scene of the crime and say, well, I'm living a different life now and I'm wearing these robes and I don't need to do all that old shit that was difficult and made me feel bad. You can't do that. You have to go to every single aspect that you can lay your hands upon and you have to learn how to get to the ones that you can't lay your hands upon, metaphorically speaking, and go to each pain and resolve it and clean that space so you can receive the signal. Because left to their own devices, again, same message, humans can do all this without too much trouble. It's only synthetic culture of the construct that prevents that self-healing um, system from looking after itself so in a lot of indigenous communities that's why they're still so important in wisdom traditions because they're not 
subject to the same carpet bombing of cultural artifacts that we are. Now, when I say culture, I want to make this a clear distinction here. Human culture is great. Human culture is music, stories, art, literature, all those wonderful things. It's brilliant. I'm not talking about that when I talk about the mainstream culture. I'm talking about Madison Avenue, and I'm talking about marketing groups, and I'm talking about corporations, and I'm talking about trends and all that stuff. That sort of culture, which is not human culture, is very artificial, it's very synthetic, and it's not for the people at all. That's a very different thing. So if tribes in Europe and North America and Canada and Africa and Australia and Eastern Europe are not subject to that bombardment, even now many of those um, communities are still in that same pristine condition. Fewer of them, of course, but still relatively large in number, comparatively speaking. If they're not subject to that, they can create the space for that signal very easily. So Aboriginal people have, in certain communities, particularly in the northern regions, the northern territories, have very, very open and normal telepathic capabilities, which we would consider as remarkable or paranormal or weird or scary or excellent. To them, it's just something that they do. So when a father dies... 200 miles away, the son knows, even though he's on a hunting party, and he has no way of knowing. And in some of those regions, of course, there's no particular telecoms or whatever. So, you know, many communities will bring certain technology in to help them, but they also respect the land by keeping it low tech. So they don't have the things that would enable us to communicate in those distances. They're doing it on the organic, old school internet, all right? So there's no silicon, there's no wires, there's no satellites. They're doing it through the energy grid, the electromagnetic field that permeates all the earth and the rocks and the trees and the sky and is fired by the sun. They're using the organic internet. And so that's why we can't discount these people. And I'm sure nowadays most sensitive, intelligent people don't anyway. But it wasn't long ago that we were regarding them as savages and as unsophisticated and uncivilized and that's because they didn't have any adeptness in all the paraphernalia of our modern culture. They didn't know, you know, what televisions were, and they didn't know what knives and forks to use in a fancy restaurant or whatever. And so we, we disregard them. And so culture, mainstream culture, does that. It separates out people who play the game from people who don't play the game. And those who don't are essentially disregarded and thrown out of the hive. And so... Going back to your earlier question, Tom, about this awakening, more and more people at the basic level are happy to leave that hive now and do what they need to do to put some bread on the table. But apart from that, they're no longer aspiring for the same things that our parents and grandparents did. They're not bothered about having a nice big six-bedroom house and three cars and a swimming pool and being respected by you know the mayor and the people in the community or whatever there's there's mm. no there's no distinction in that anymore there's no distinguishing uh, allure of that whatsoever in fact it's considered a bit crap really mm. and so people are taking hold of their own independence in a much more healthy and normal human fashion so that is definitely something that we can all see if we look closely enough right when are the um things that as far as the telepathy um for myself and, and i've heard a lot of people complain about this you know when you're in, in in that in between stage between awake and asleep and you can pretty much remember what's going on um sometimes i'll have like a telepathic message and it'll either be garble or very low and i and one day i said speak up i can't hear you i said no matter how loud i i speak you still won't be able to hear me. So my question to you, for a lot of us who are starting to get either messages from other humans or beyond, is that because of the blockage that we've created, or is there a way that you yourself do to, to unblock these? Yeah, that's a, that's a good practical question. It's important. This. I think there's, there's two 
there's two things to consider on this. The first one is that from a metaphysical aspect, it very much helps us if we understand that we exist as multidimensional beings. And I always, particularly at conferences, emphasize this. It's a very, very important point, and a lot of things begin with this knowledge. We don't just exist in one place at one time. We exist in several places at several times. And as soon as you go out of the third density, up, so to speak, then even time ceases to be quite the thing it was. Um, and that temporality shifts. And as soon as you start messing with time, then a lot of what we call paranormal phenomena become very simple. So if you can pause time and travel from New York to Los Angeles and then unpause time, it looks like you've just done something phenomenal. It looks like you've teleported. If you, if you can take a message into the field and go directly to the person who needs to see that, or hear that message, then again, that's like clairaudience, or see it clairvoyance. And if you want to go and take a look at something, as the military have been doing for about 100 years now, as a remote viewer, what you're essentially doing is shifting the frequency of your consciousness into a fourth density state and quieting the mind in the same way that a yogi or a monk would do. And reducing that static because when you do that that link that is always there begins to activate you don't have to establish the link it's already established what we have to do is turn down the static so we can hear it and as you say we tend to confuse that with actual physical hearing like the cochlear apparatus inside our ear it's not like that it's sometimes presents itself as an inner voice but sometimes just as a thought form or a dialogue what it really is is a spontaneous connection a spontaneous field uplink i would call it to that fourth density state and in that hypnagogic state just before you drop off to sleep that's when the mind is at its quietest because it's just about to shift gear and start doing something different or completely you know shift down altogether but when it's in neutral regardless of where it's going to go next, uh, when it's in neutral, the static reduces. And when that reduces, we can hear the vibrations, if you like, from the higher self. And, in some, and depending on who you are, that presents itself as visuals or thoughts or dreams or visions or voices or whatever. But actually, what it is, is you're just opening up a higher set of perceptive apparatus you're opening up a higher frequency of perception. And it's very normal. It's very organic. Everybody can do it. Um, but because it's so outside the mainstream construct, because it's so unusual and it's so scary to the people who want to keep humans contained, um, it's just turned into fiction, really. And it's scoffed at in the mainstream. And academia scoff at it even now. And so even talking about these matters, it, it, you know, you go to certain gatherings, you know, people talk about celestial beings and light beings and draconians and elves and goblins and stuff. And I can sometimes, you know, imagine if I just pulled in someone off the street and stood them next to me to hear this, they would think they'd gone to another planet in another era. <laughs> And just think, what the hell? Elves? Did you say elves then? I thought you said elves, you know. And we'll just think, oh my gosh, you know, this is crazy. I'm going to, it's a cult. Something strange is going on. And it's, it's, that's how massive and profound the conditioning is in that third density state. So to take people into a wider world to appreciate that there is much more going on, the only way you can do it is experientially is to, is to bring them that shift of consciousness. And there's a lot of debate on the best ways to do this, to do it right. chemically with psychedelics, entheogens, sacred plants, sacraments, whatever you want to call it, to do it with chemicals or to do it without chemicals. And those are the, essentially the two methods. And within each, there are many, many subsets and many, many paths to go. And always it depends on the individual. Like some people don't like to drink wine, never touch it. 
some people love wine you know some people like red meat some people it's a it's a horror a horror story that they will only eat vegetables you know it's it's a very personal thing it depends on your body your mind your culture your background everything the point is however that there are many different ways to do this and I discussed this in in the workshop very briefly and we only had three hours to, to play with so we couldn't go into a enormous amount of detail but we said you know there's meditation and hypnosis hypnosis dance near-death experiences you know the Europeans and North Americans would practice exposure by putting people in the wilderness to change the consciousness and of course nowadays you know ayahuasca journeys are sort of like as commonplace as going for a Starbucks coffee or whatever it's everybody's doing it you know it's in the media people are making films about it in the mainstream pop stars and movie stars are doing it ayahuasca is like you know it's the new coca-cola really it's, it's nothing special anymore but what what people are talking about is using um, tryptamines and ibogoids and beta carbolines and so on to redirect the energy in the brain to switch off certain filters to switch off that static and when you switch off the static you can make new connections some of which are already there the one to your higher self we can call it is already there but the fascinating thing about this fourth dimensional space is that there are other things there as well other things live there and have done for a very very long time right. and it's a massive diversity a massive um, ecology of different beings from different places with different expectations and different ambitions and different patterns of behavior. And that is so extraordinary and so alien to the, to the regular human being, even the, the spiritual human being who, who is pushing into those realms, that a lot of those beings, particularly what we might call the positive ones, use archetypal images to make it understandable to us. So they will present themselves as jaguars or snakes or goddesses or demons or animals or whatever. And very often, interestingly, that is despite one's background, they will choose the archetypal resonance of the area. So again and again you'll hear people who take ayahuasca particularly in the amazon of brazil guatemala wherever will go to this place take it and see the archetypal images of that area that previously they'd never seen before which is an indication that the resonance is dependent on the uh, dominant feeling and the dominant expectations of the consciousness in that area which is which i find fascinating Okay, well, we're about at the end of our first hour here, Neil. Where can people get a hold of your material? I know you have the audio cleaver out and you've got a fantastic website. Would you share that with us, please? Sure, yeah. You can go to neilkramer.com, and there, there is basically a lot of essays and interviews and materials that people could spend an awfully long time going through if they so wish. There's also a store on there, uh, the Audio Cleaver, Transitional Alchemy. There'll be some new projects going up there very soon, which people can take a look at. There's a book coming out soon. That's in the pipeline. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot. But neilkramer.com, uh, and you can get to other things from there, like uh, Facebook updates and little kind of more domestic news items that people might want to uh, take a look at. So neilkramer.com is the place. Great. Well, thank you, and thank everybody for listening. Uh, we will be continuing with another hour in the archives, so after uh, Brooks's show is over, why don't you pop on over and check out the second hour of our conversation with Neil. No, I was just going to say the website is uh, www.thehundredthmonkeyradio.com. Condemnation um, without investigation is the height of ignorance, and we will talk to you guys later. 